Hello there, lovely people. It's Alex from Nintendo Life here, and today it is finally time for us to review Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition on the Nintendo Switch. This review was originally written by the excellent Mitch Vogel and has been adapted for video by me. Before we get into it though, just a really quick disclaimer, we are only going to be showing footage from relatively early in the game. Because the game is so ludicrously story-driven, we don't want to risk any kind of spoilers whatsoever, so it's going to be like mega early just so you know. But anyway, that's more than enough waffling, let's dive right into things. <laughs> If you were around to browse the lovely site that is Nintendolife.com about nine years ago, you may well have been privy to the rising support for localization of a game called Xenoblade Chronicles. Back then, the title was just a niche Japanese RPG that Nintendo was extremely hesitant to release outside of the country, but the fans saw something in it that just seemed to justify the outcry. As time would have it, this was the right move, as Xenoblade Chronicles turned out to be one of the greatest RPGs of modern times, and a key marker in Japanese game development slowly rising out of that rut that it had fallen in at the time. Since those days, Xenoblade has spawned a couple of sequels and become a tentpole franchise in Nintendo's ongoing release schedule, though the original release has taken on a legendary status that its follow-ups have had a bit of a hard time living up to. I like Xenoblade Chronicles X, I don't care what anyone says. Nintendo could quite easily have just done a simple half-baked re-release to give Switch owners an opportunity to play it on the new platform, but instead, they decided to take things above and beyond for this definitive edition. Good news, it lives up to that name. Please don't leave the review, we've got more to say. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition is unquestionably the greatest way to experience this gaming classic, expertly layering in new elements over the already wonderful foundation to make for a complete must-have release. The game has a rather unique premise in how a majority of its story takes place on the massive bodies of two titans who fought each other to the death in long-forgotten times. And although that battle may be long since concluded, the primary race living on the sinister Maconis Titan fits fittingly named Mekon, are still hell-bent on wiping out as many of the human-like Homs as they possibly can that live over on the Bionis. The story picks up in the middle of a decisive battle between the Homs and the Mekon, which leads to a shaky stalemate between the two sides, but one that's doomed to kick loose at any moment. Our main character, Shulk, is a bright young Homs researcher who whiles away his hours in Colony 9 during this fragile piece, studying the mysterious sword known only as the Monado, which he believes may have been wielded by the Bionis itself in the battle that led to its demise. Shulk's research is soon interrupted, however, when the Mechon return and completely decimate his colony, initiating a personal quest for revenge that sees him taking the Monado for himself to hopefully finish this war once and for all. Shulk is initially joined by his best friend Ryan on this journey, but the two slowly amass a small group of friends and allies along the way, who have each been affected by the war with the Mechon and share the same desire for the violence to end. Perhaps one of the best aspects aspects of the story of Xenoblade Chronicles, and something that its later sequels largely fail to recapture, is the masterful balance that it demonstrates between melancholy and good old-fashioned goofiness. For example, though Shulk is almost always the optimist of the group and the one that endeavours to see the best in everyone they meet, his link with the Monado also grants him the ability to receive random, incomplete visions of the future. These visions are often of his friends dying or similarly harrowing events, and he is forced to bear the weight of that knowledge, not knowing whether he'll be able able to alter the outcome. Not every single person you bump into along the way is going to make it alive out of this story, and that naturally leads to some surprisingly heartfelt interactions as these characters bond over their struggles. Things are kept from becoming too depressing, however, via the regular and tasteful use of humour and positive thinking throughout the story. For example, nearly every time you accept a side quest from somebody, at least one of the members in your party will say something encouraging or supportive as you're in the middle of accepting the request. Or, in another example, the almost 
arguably annoying race of Nopon are part of nearly every community you come across, and their simple grammar and third-person talking style are often played for subtle comic effect. Between elements like this and the heavier themes of war and loss, Xenoblade Chronicles proves to have a remarkably well-balanced sense of storytelling that keeps you invested as the dozens of hours roll by. The main draw of Xenoblade Chronicles is that this is essentially an open-world JRPG with big chuffing environments to explore, the likes of which you wouldn't be used to seeing outside of something like an MMO, though it's not all contained in one seamless environment like, say, Breath of the Wild. Shulk's journey see him and his crew making their way along the top of the Bionis, and each portion of the Titan's body acts as its own self-huge contained area that you can explore at will. And a little side note, when, when you're in an area and you just want to fast travel to another area, the load times still impress me. Each area is packed with a variety of side quests to complete, secret areas to uncover, and unique enemies to kill and harvest for parts. And most of the environments are built in such a way that really sells the idea of you being this tiny organism traipsing across the splendorous and massive corpse of a planet-sized creature. There's something about the world design that manages to instill a rare sense of awe when we were playing it, making the adventure that much more gripping as you continue to encounter new and ever more astounding sights. Every new area you run into begs you to explore in search of new secrets, and the worlds are designed in such a way that exploration is almost always rewarded with something particularly delicious. Along the way, your party will frequently find itself embroiled in combat, which has some nice depth in it without being too overly complicated. Although, admittedly, the first time you get hold of it, you might be thinking, what's going on? Don't worry, you'll pick it up. Fights play out in a real-time setting that sees your characters continually auto-attacking, while a hotbar of manually activated skills known as arts give you plenty of options for extra actions that are governed by cooldowns. A big part of this system as well is positioning, where the ideal art to cast is often dependent on where your character is in relation to the enemy. Shulk's iconic backslash, for example, will do twice as much damage if you do it when behind an enemy, whilst his air slash will inflict a slow debuff on the enemy if he casts it whilst beside them. This can lead to some intensely dynamic fights as you're continually sat there juggling your lead character's cooldowns and positioning in the moment while simultaneously planning a few steps ahead as you work to set up combos and chain attacks with your other characters. Underlying all of this is a neat mechanic that ties nicely with the story in which Shulk will occasionally receive a vision of the future where he witnesses an attack that will take down one of the party members or at least just do a chuffing large amount of damage if nothing is done. You're then given just a few seconds to avert this outcome either by casting an art yourself or warning another teammate to do something about it. It's a simple idea and one that doesn't really get triggered in the smaller fights that you'll be coming across more frequently, but it can massively affect your chances of success if you dare try punching above your weight, and it adds a nice little wrinkle to the flow of combat. Though this base combat is itself varied enough to be interesting for dozens of hours, a big part of its fun factor can be found in exploring the diverse range of playstyles that Monolith Soft has set up with the different parts members. For example, Ryan is centered around having a massive health pool, and most of his attacks are designed to draw as much enemy attention to himself as possible. Charlotte, on the other hand, just as an example, kind of tends to balance between being a healer and being sort of a semi-attacker, but from long range. She's best suited to trying to stay away from the close quarters side of things and try and inflict various debuffs on the enemy, as well as healing your other characters with helpful bullets. If you find yourself getting bored of always playing as Shulk, you're usually free to put whichever party member you'd like in the lead role, and this guarantees that the combat gameplay stays interesting throughout the lengthy journey. Though your characters gain experience and level up as usual, there are also various other forms of progression that you can engage in to suitably min-max each character's stats. Over time, each character will learn more arts that can tweak their playstyle, and these arts can be then leveled up individually to heighten their effectiveness and lower cooldown times. Additionally, each character has multiple skill trees that offer up various passive buffs once you hit certain milestones, and these skills can then be shared between party members via affinity. What's nice about these interlocking systems, for progression at least, is the fact that you're always advancing something at any given point in time. If it isn't leveling up a character, you've probably got an art that you can at least advance. If it isn't a new skill unlock, it's a fresh piece of armor that you can now afford, 
or wear if you're Rhine. Rhine can wear heavy armor. Through this continuous advancement, Xenoblade Chronicles entirely avoids any sense of stagnation, which gives the whole adventure a continuous and exhilarating sense of forward momentum. It's so, so easy to get caught up in doing just one more quest and finding you've lost another hour or 12 as that one quest has turned into 50. A big portion of this forward motion is due to the previously mentioned affinity system, which acts as a sort of a catch-all term for the relationships which between virtually every named character in the game, and I don't just mean like the ones that actually have something in the story, just the random townsfolk, they're also on there. It's extensive. Each part of the Bionis usually has at least one large village or community that acts as a hub for all the quests in that area, and completing quests for people there will raise your affinity in that region. Sometimes this leads you to improving the connection between NPCs, other times it leads you to unlocking new quest lines, and as your affinity continues to rise, you'll then unlock new options for items that you can trade for with the people in that community. What this amounts to is a remarkably expansive and in-depth take on side quest content, expanding it far beyond beyond what most RPGs do with the idea, even if it's a bit complicated. Having said all that, it must be said that the majority of side quests themselves aren't all that much to write home about. With a few exceptions, side quests are mostly low effort fetch quests and monster hunts that don't vary all that much from each other in the bigger picture. That being said, the system works surprisingly well because you can stack as many side quests as you want at any time. In practice, this means that the typical flow when coming to a new area is to first collect every single side side quest you possibly can, then by simply going out and exploring as you usually would, you'll quite likely clear at least a lot of them just by doing what you'd usually do. Another important factor to consider then is that these side quests ensure that you are getting the most out of each area, as they'll generally send you to every single nook and cranny and guarantee that you'll get the most gorgeous views that the game has to offer. As with any game like this, your mileage will vary in terms of how you approach the potential tedium, but suffice to say that there is a substantial substantial amount of content on offer here that is sure to be quite addictive to RPG lovers. One of the headlining features of this remake is the all-new future-connected storyline, which acts as a standalone roughly 15-hour epilogue through an area of the Bionis that was cut from the original release. It takes place about a year after the events of the main game, and without spoiling too much, we'll just say that it delves much deeper into Melia's character and highlights more of her relationship with Shulk. Gameplay here is kept largely the same as the base game, although the chain attack has been replaced with a slightly tweaked version involving various Nopon that you can find throughout the region in a sort of extended side quest. It would be disingenuous to suggest that this new epilogue acts as an absolute must-see part of Xenoblade Chronicles, but neither is it something to be outright dismissed. It's unique enough in its storytelling and gameplay mechanics to feel like a semi-standalone product, but it also doesn't stray too far from the award-winning formula that made the base game such a fantastic experience. Experience. Those of you hoping that this was somehow going to be a mind-blowing new expansion will be a little bit disappointed then, but it's quite difficult to complain about finally getting access to previously cut content that's been given its own standalone story and fleshed out in full. Future Connected ultimately amounts to what is essentially another 15 to 20 hours of original content for Xenoblade Chronicles, which is far from a bad thing given the legacy of this game. There's also the new Time Attack mode, I suppose? This is just a series of challenges where you're tasked with trying to defeat a big group and series of waves of enemies as quickly as you possibly can. Occasionally, you can just use the team you're used to using, or sometimes you will be forced to use certain characters. And it mixes things up quite nicely. At the end of it all, you'll be given a grade, and a higher grade means a better payout. And the rewards can be fun and interesting, or sometimes just downright useful. There's nothing out of this world about this mode, but it is interesting enough, and it does offer a nice break from the story every now and then, and can be surprisingly challenging. Though this new story acts as the most marketable draw for this new Definitive Edition release, we'd argue that the various nips and tucks along the way to streamline the game further are what really elevate this leaps and bounds above its already impressive source material. Monolith Soft did a full 100-point restoration over the original release, and has virtually removed any semblance of the archaic tedium from the original design. For example, side quest objectives are now clearly displayed on the minimap in real time, and the game will lead you directly to monsters or item pickups that you need to get to continue. Or in another example, the previously clunky UI has been completely overhauled in favour of a new design which surprisingly reminds us of the Switch's operating system user interface. 
It's quite bizarre. In light of this, icons are easier to read, battle information is better conveyed, and there's far less confusion when coming to grips with the finer points of progression or battle systems. These kinds of tweaks and additions may not really sound like much to write home about, but there are so many little quality of life updates here that the original feels outright unpleasant to play in hindsight. That might be slightly hyperbolous, but we're sticking with it. This is beyond a doubt the smoothest that an entry in the Xenoblade series has ever played. Monolith Soft has smartly integrated improvements from later sequels, whilst also including even more features that combine to make this an absolute dream to play. We'd be remiss to discuss this game without taking some time at least to focus on the absolutely incredible presentation on offer right here. Though the original was packed with breathtaking visuals, the up-close shots of models and and textures revealed that the graphics were, let's just say, humble. All of that is gone in this version. Textures have been updated, new shaders have been applied, lighting looks better, and the character models are basically brand sp I mean, they are brand spanking new. Visually, it's kind of splitting the difference between the sort of semi-gritty realistic look of the original and the much more anime styling of the sequel Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Most importantly, Xenoblade Chronicles looks great whether you're playing in docked or handheld, running at 30 frames a second in both modes. Though the dynamic resolution means it doesn't hit max resolution on either front, it nonetheless looks to be far ahead of the blurry messiness that you could find in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. We'd personally say that this is the best that any Xenoblade game has looked to date, and it certainly deserves to be in the running for one of the most visually impressive releases on the Switch today. Even though it's not hitting the max resolution and the max frame rate, there's just something about the art style and everything else marrying together to be just lovely. And all of this is backed by an excellent soundtrack that has been sort of remastered. The developers reportedly had neither the time nor the funding to get a full orchestra to redo the entire soundtrack, so only certain recurring or more likely popular tracks were retooled for this new release. That being said, there's not a single track on offer here that doesn't in some way help to masterfully set the mood. That soaring, sweeping track that plays when you first enter Gower Plains, which is probably called Gower Plains, perfectly encapsulates the grandiose and awe-inspiring size of the new playground you find yourself in. However, if you don't like the new versions, you can always just use the old versions as well, they're still here. We also feel that special attention needs to be paid to the quality of the voice acting. Whilst the writing can often veer into the corny territory, we commend the voice actors for just flat out totally committing to it and playing their roles with a kind of earnestness that's rare to find in a dub for a JRPG. Maybe it's my bias being from the UK, but there's something oddly comforting with hearing Ryan Bray, what a bunch of jokers, for the millionth time after a battle. You can turn the voices in battle off, and I have personally done that. It's still happens when you're doing cutscenes and everything which is good I just I, I just don't want them to happen so often I just want a little bit a little bit but it's too much too much for me but who knows maybe the campiness will grow on you simply put there's almost nothing one can reasonably complain about to actually spoil the game when it comes to Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition what we have here is an already excellent JRPG that has been improved in, t in nearly every conceivable way short of a complete remaking like Final Fantasy or something on top of the fantastic story enjoyable combat and incredible world design we've also got an entirely new epilogue story arc and also improving upon pretty much everything in the game and polishing everything to the nth degree from progression systems to visuals to ui design it's all here and it's all better xenoblade chronicles definitive edition is easily one of the greatest rpgs available on the switch to date and will no doubt stand the test of time it goes without saying that if you were ever a fan of the original or of rpgs in general you absolutely must get this game. Even if you wouldn't consider yourself a fan, we still strongly recommend that you at least consider adding this to your collection, as this is the standard against which most JRPGs should be judged. Looks a lordy, it's Alex's personal thoughts, and honestly, I don't have many. I kind of sprinkled them into the main review for this one, <laughs> because why not? If you watch my preview, you may well know that I personally was a little bit lukewarm about Future Connected, and that's kind of still the case, to be honest. 
I don't think it's bad by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not, it, it kind of missed the mark for what Xenoblade was to me originally. But at the end of the day, it's still, it's still more Xenoblade, you know, it's still more Xenoblade and it's bonus and you can do it straight from the off. I think the way that they've done it and the way they presented it is remarkable. They've done the best way of doing it. The fact that you can do it straight away, just brilliant. But the original story is the one that I remember. The original story is the thing that I love and I almost think it would be impossible to live up to it because obviously I'm going to be looking at the original story through rose-tinted lenses so it's probably a damn good reason I didn't do the review, but I 100% agree with Mitch. This is just, this is a phenomenal RPG. And as many of you have said in the comments of the preview and spoken to me about, yeah, you're just like, Alex, you're not an RPG guy. And it's like, yeah, this is the exception. This is the exception. And I think part of it definitely is the fact that it, it definitely has a unique identity with the voice acting. And I know for a lot of people it's like, oh, it's it's too campy, it's too cheesy, but I don't know. I, I think it's it's really pleasing. It really pleases me, and certainly in the cutscenes and everything, the timing as well is it's just good, you know? The timing's good. And as Mitch said, people the actors have just thrown themselves into these roles. And they've just they've just done an excellent job. They really, really have. And I can't stress this enough. Xenoblade Chronicles is bleak. It is really bleak at times, and it really hits home that this is a dire situation, and that things aren't all, you know, peaches and gravy. Things are going bad. Things happen. Bad things. And they're not good. They're not fun. And it kind of rips you away from the kind of goofiness, as Mitch perfectly stated. And that's something that I think is maybe not lost on some people, but definitely something that doesn't get mentioned enough, in my opinion. So, for that alone, Blooming, get this!